Well, welcome back from break. Last session, we went through all the ABCs of earthquakes and how they work, and now you're all experts. For this session, we're going to go through earthquake bracing protocol and how do you determine what to secure in your business or your organization. You know, there are lots of codes and requirements to choose from. It gets kind of complicated when deciding what to do. We have the UBC, the Universal Building Code, the CBC, the California Building Code. There are additional codes for each of those for existing buildings. We have something called SB 1953. That's the seismic code that was created for California hospitals. And there are lots of fire codes, and they can vary by what they require and how they're enforced based on the community that you're located in. But I think the best way to take a look at how to determine what you're going to do is look at other entities and how they have done this. No need to reinvent the wheel here. So the first thing we're going to look at is California hospitals. You know, after the Northridge earthquake, almost 20 hospitals closed down. None of them fell down. These hospitals were closed because of damage from the earthquake to non-structural systems inside the hospital. What does a non-structural system include? Well, it includes all the things you may find underneath the ceiling in your business. The furniture and equipment, maybe in a lab or manufacturing or office setting. It all got tossed about in this Northridge earthquake. So SB 1953 was passed. It addresses some structural vulnerabilities, but it also spends a lot of time on non-structural elements. Hospitals are required to secure contents in their critical care areas by this mandate. How is that determined? The first thing it is taken into account is something called an importance factor. It is important to know what your importance factor is for your building. There are a lot of things that go into making up the importance factor, or, or it's called IP. One of the things that go into making it up is how long are you comfortable having your business out of business after an earthquake? The higher the IP number, the lower the amount of time it's okay for you to be down. In a hospital, as you can imagine, we want no downtime. Hospitals need to continue functioning following an earthquake. So their IP is a number of 1.5. And that number is important to remember because we'll refer to the IP as we go through examples. How do you determine what items to brace to a 1.5 IP in a California hospital in order to comply with the law? Well, the size of the item, the value of the item, and the location of the item while being important factors in order to meet the law are all trumped by how the item is used. You may have a small microscope located in the back of a room, but if that microscope is critical to the operation of that lab or that room, by law it must be secured. So it's the function of the item that drives whether or not that item is secured. And once the determination is made, that the item must be secured, the engineering that goes into securing it is developed to an IP or importance factor of 1.5. That's what's done in hospitals. But there are some other examples. As university number one will be my first example, I'll let you know that it covers a lot of different acres, a whole bunch of different buildings of all different types in Northern California. These are new buildings and old buildings. They have labs and dorms and meeting halls and cafeterias, all different types of items in use in these buildings. And the protocol the university has established is that the, if the value of the item in question is more than $20,000, then the policy is that item must be secured. It doesn't matter how big it is. All of us have seen probably very small items that cost a lot of money. It doesn't matter where that item is located or what its function is. What drives the bracing protocol is the value of the item, $20,000 or more. At the same university, our example number two here, there's also a school of medicine. The protocol for bracing at the school of medicine at the same university is not the same as the rest of the campus. They're not driven by the $20,000 threshold. 
Instead, what drives that protocol is whether or not the piece of equipment is critical to the science that is happening in a certain building. Why would they do that? Well, the fear is that after an earthquake, even the smallest equipment could get damaged and the lag time to get new equipment is so long that the scientists and their grant money may leave the university and go somewhere else to do their research. And the past has proven that, that that does indeed happen. So the University School of Medicine, the same university where the $20,000 protocol is in place at the School of Medicine, if a piece of equipment is critical to science and protecting grant money, regardless of its value, its size, weight, or location, it must be secured. A completely different protocol. Not too far from that university, we have a biotech campus. It's a large campus, more than 80 buildings. Some of the buildings are brand new and some are old, and a lot of labs exist in these buildings with a lot of science going on. There's all different sizes and shapes of equipment scattered throughout the buildings, but the protocol for the company is driven by the EHNS, Environmental Health and Safety Department. And that protocol dictates that people working in the buildings have to be able to get out of the building in an earthquake. So it is driven, the protocol, by escapability. So we will have items at the front of a room that are the same size, weight, and function of the exact same type of item at the back of the room, but only the items at the front of the room are secured. And whereas in universities one and two, no IP was required, at the biotech campus, an IP of 1.5 is required. So additional engineering goes into place. It is peer reviewed back and forth between the vendor and the company, structural engineers, until a bracing protocol is determined. And then the items that are in hallways and at the front of the rooms are then secured to an IP of 1.5. Not too far from the biotech campus is yet another university. This is another large campus that covers three different zip codes, all different types of buildings, all different functions, from one year old to 100 years old. The protocol at the university is driven by the fire marshal who is responsible for this area. And he has made a determination that all equipment in all buildings must be secured if it weighs more than 100 pounds. So it doesn't matter what the value of the item is, what its function is, or where it's located. What drives the bracing protocol is the weight of the item. There is an importance factor of 1.5. An independent structural engineer has created a bracing protocol packet. All items that are going to be secured in order to get a sign off by the fire marshal for occupancy must be anchored using the protocol packet. There is one additional resource for businesses that is brand new. FEMA has a Quake Smart program. But what is Quake Smart here? Quake Smart is a new business resiliency program that is free and allows companies to access a back to business assessment as well as search for vulnerabilities to the structure the systems, which are the items above the ceiling, and the space, which are the items below the ceiling, in determining what should be done to secure items to get ready for an earthquake. So that is another resource that is available. So how do you determine what items you should secure in your business to get ready for an earthquake? Well, certainly, as in California hospitals and in the School of Medicine, the function of the item and how important it is to you continuing to do business must be taken into consideration. In the case of the biotech campus, using an escapability mandate also is critical. That also meets a lot of the fire codes. Can people get out of the building? Is an item so large that it could hurt someone? And in the case of the university number one example, the value of an item certainly does matter. You don't want to lose items that are an important part of your inventory or that generate revenue for you. So the recommendation is that you take the best of all of these. You use engineering and you make a determination on what items you should secure in your own business.
And that's how you do business continuity bracing protocol.